Welcome back to Lecture 3 Part 2 on Fluid Balance and Edema. Hopefully these hormones look a bit familiar to you. These are our major hormones responsible for regulating the balance of fluids in our body. ADH has an effect on the distal convoluted tubule, the kidney nephron, and the collecting duct. It retains water when needed. Aldosterone kind of does the same thing but less directly. It reabsorbs sodium while excreting potassium and water follows sodium back into the bloodstream. ANP and BNP, atrial natriuretic peptide and brain natriuretic peptide, both stimulate the kidney to get rid of sodium. So they are essentially opposites of aldosterone, aren't they? As you can see from the diagram, they're all interrelated along with renin, angiotensinogen, angiotensin 1, ACE, and angiotensin 2 to regulate blood pressure by increasing or decreasing water volume in the blood system. Do you remember that little system? I told you it would come up again, but you need to know it really well. Try to work each hormone out with how it relates to increasing or decreasing blood pressure. If you have to, draw out the mechanism so you don't get confused. As in, increased aldosterone in your blood would cause what to do with your blood pressure? Correct, it'll increase it. More aldosterone equals more sodium retention equals more water retention. More water inside of your uh, blood vessels equals increased blood pressure. Increased aldosterone, the same thing, except now we're not actually increasing sodium in the blood, we're just straight out increasing water retention. What about increased ANP and BNP? Remember, they're the opposites of aldosterone, right? So they're going to decrease your blood pressure. Let me fix that. We've seen before that osmotic gradients within the body are established by changing salt concentrations. Therefore, sodium, chloride, and water balance are strongly interrelated. The negatively charged chloride ions will follow the movement of positively charged um, sodium ions and water moves to where salt concentration are highest in order to equalize the concentration gradients or neutralize it if you will. Sodium balance within the body is normally regulated by aldosterone and to a lesser extent the natriuretic hormones. Water balance is hormonally regulated by ADH. So let's talk about alterations of electrolyte balance for a bit. First, we need to keep in mind that it's essential that individual electrolyte concentrations are narrowly maintained for proper cellular function. Alterations that lead to an excess concentration of a given electrolyte are labeled with the prefix hyper, while deficiencies are prefixed with hypo, like hypernatremia, hypercalcemia, hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, that sort of thing. Sodium accounts for approximately 90% of the cations or positively charged in the extracellular fluid. As the primary osmotic constituent, changes in its concentration directly influence water balance. Sodium also plays a key role in the establishment of the resting membrane potential in excitable tissues. Therefore, alterations in its concentration also produce neural and muscular manifestations. Let's throw this up here because I want to put it all up here at first. And let's start with hypernatremia on the right hand side. Uh, that may be the result of absolute increases in sodium concentration by increased dietary intake or from decreased sodium excretion, secondary to a number of different conditions. Relative increases result from decreased fluid intake or increased loss of extracellular fluid while retaining sodium. 
secondary to a number of different conditions. Notice how relative means that the sodium level really didn't change, but it seems like it did because the fluid that held the sodium was decreased. Therefore, it's more concentrated, right? As water tends to follow sodium salts, increased absolute quantities of sodium lead to hypervolemia, too much volume, neuromuscular symptoms, and a shift of fluid from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid. As relative increases are associated with decreased absolute fluid volume, symptoms include manifestations associated with hypovolemia while still presenting the manifestations associated with a shift of fluid from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid. Look on the uh, left hand side, hyponatremia may be the result of pure sodium deficits such as those caused by excess extra renal losses or inadequate in intake. Dilutional hyponatremias are the result of excess fluid intake or decreased fluid loss. Regardless of the cause, hyponatremia causes a shift of fluid from the extracellular fluid to the intracellular fluid resulting in cellular edema. Before we leave this slide, you might want to pause and look at these causes of both hyper and hyponatremia. Although it's tempting to make a flashcard or two and memorize these causes, I'm not sure if it's the best use of your time. Sure, knowing these may help you recognize a possible scenario that is causing hyper or hyponatremia, but it might be better if you just take a few minutes and try to understand these conditions rather than memorize them. Ask yourself, does that make sense? Or does it make sense that vomiting or diarrhea would cause less sodium in the blood? Does it make sense that taking diuretics, medicine that causes you to lose salt and water, would lead to less sodium in the blood? What about if I had too little ADH? What would that do to my sodium levels in my blood? To a certain extent, we can also do this with the signs and symptoms of hyper and hyponatremia, but they may not fit as well into what we might naturally think. If it was me, I'd spend my flashcards on these instead. Although, having said that, these signs and symptoms actually do make sense if you know what sodium does and in our bodies. We'll talk about that actually in a little bit. Since we're talking about sodium and water retention, actually, let's pick this up next time. We'll start next time with diabetes insipidus.